Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch. In this video, I'd like to make the case for why you should learn and discover the power of creating your own custom bindings. They may sound scary at first, but you'll see that after we've created a few of them in this video, they're not really that scary at all. And they're extremely useful for a number of different scenarios that you'll run into with your Swift UI coding. I have a starter project for this video, and I recommend that you download it from the link in the description. It's the starter project branch for this project that contains the starter application that we'll be working on. There's also a completed source code branch as well that'll contain the completed code. But I recommend that you work along with me as you'll gain a better understanding if you do work along. And in the end, you'll have a reference project that you can keep going back to in the future. So just download and expand the zipped archive from the starter project branch. Now here's a scenario that you might come across often. In this first tab view, you can see that we have two text fields. One is displaying a text field to enter the name and is bound to a name string property that's initialized as an empty string. And in the second for entering an age, it's an int with an initial value of zero. And in both cases, as I make changes to the text field, the results are also displayed below in a text view that has been formatted with a custom view modifier to display the text off to the right in a caption font. What I'd like to do is to make each one of these state properties optional. So let's start with the name text field first and declare it as an optional string with no initial value. This breaks the first section as text fields can't be bound to an optional string. In this case, we must create a custom binding with a getter and a setter to handle the case where it is optional. Until we do that, let's also first comment out this text view. So we'll need to replace the dollar name with a custom binding using the binding initializer. But first, let's separate this into two arguments onto separate lines using control M. So now I'm going to replace the dollar name with a binding with a getter and a setter where both are closures. In the get case, there is no closure argument whereas in the setter there is. And again, I'm going to use control M to separate them on two separate lines. So let me tap enter on both to get the closures. And then in the set case, we get a value that the user has typed in, and we can give it a name like entry that we can use in the closure. Well, when we want to present the value in the text field, we'll simply present what is currently in the name state variable. But since it's optional, we'll need to provide a string for that optional case. So let's use nil coalescing to provide an empty string. And then when someone types in a new name, that is the entry variable. So we can apply that to the name field. Now this is okay, except once someone types something in, that name field will never again be optional, even if the user removes everything from the field it will set it to an empty string. Now this may be fine with you, but if someone clears the text entry field and you want it to be set back to an optional, in that case, we'll have to do something else. We'll first have to check to see if the entry is an empty string. And then if so, we'll set the name to nil. Otherwise, we'll apply that entry to the name variable. Well, now I can uncomment the text view and since the name now is optional, we can provide an alternate string using nil coalescing. So let's specify that the string is nil if in fact the string is a nil value. Now you see by default, it is showing nil because name is nil initially. However, if I start typing, it gets replaced. If I go back and remove the entry, it goes back to nil. Well, this is all good, but you'll likely never see any examples if you're searching for this via the web or ChatGPT that looks like this. Because as coders, we often like to be efficient at the cost of clarity. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, let's copy this setter and then comment it out and paste it back in again so that we have a reference and we can modify the copied version. This if-else clause can be simplified by using a nil coalescer. The name property is going to be equal to either nil or entry, depending on whether or not entry is empty. So we can simply replace this with name equals, 
and then checking if the entry is empty, and if that's the case, nil. Otherwise, it'll be entry. Now, since this closure is a single statement and it uses the entry argument that we get from the text entry, we can remove this label entry altogether and then replace it with the shorthand $0 every time that entry is used. And since both get and set are on a single line, we'll often see the closures are compressed and presented on the same line as the label. This is much cleaner, but perhaps more difficult to understand. So keep the comment and version around if you need to refer to something. I hope you're enjoying this video, and if you are, please give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment. It would also really help if you could subscribe to my channel and enable notifications so that you're alerted when I drop a new one here on YouTube. I put out weekly videos and I seldom miss a week, so if you really want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. A link is in the description. Now let's check out our text field that's displaying a numeric field. So I'm going to make it an optional int instead. This time, there's no problem with the text field, but the text view is going to be complaining, so I'm going to comment that out first. We can enter new ages and our age variable updates. But what happens if I remove the entry? No problem. Whereas it was a problem with the text field that was bound to a string. So if we option click on the text field for the name text field, you'll see that the requirement is that the text has to be bound to a string, not an optional string. That's why we had to use a custom binding. If I do the same and option click on the age text field, however, you'll see that it's bound to an optional value that has a format type, and that's why we can use an optional int. So let's uncomment the text field now and surround it with an if let to unwrap the age if it's not optional. Then, as an else statement, I'm going to present the text view with the string nil and apply the same value display modifier. Now you can see that when the field is empty, age is nil, but as soon as I enter something, it's no longer nil. Now perhaps a more common scenario is when you have an optional date in your app. Right now in this view, our date is not optional. So let me make it an optional date, and that's going to break our view as date pickers must be bound to a non-optional date property. For this example then, I want to create a computed property for our binding instead of doing it in line with the view. So below our now optional date, I'm going to create a private variable that I'm going to call date binding that is of type binding as a date. And then I can return my binding in the closure. So I'm going to create the binding once more with the getter and setter. And then if I tap on the placeholders to expand the closures, something strange appears to happen. When I tapped on the closures, the label for the get was removed. Now, if this kind of behavior is confusing to you, I highly recommend that you watch my video on understanding trailing closure syntax, where I go over this exact type of scenario. Anyway, for the getter, which is the first closure, we can simply return the selected date, if it's not nil, and then return the current date, if it is, using nil coalescing. For the setter, we can set the selected date to whatever the entry date that was chosen. And then if you want, in the setter, you can clean this up a bit as we did in our first example. We can use a $0 for every instance where the entry date has been entered and remove the entry date in. That whole trailing closure syntax can be quite confusing at first, but hopefully you'll sort it out by watching that video I referenced. If you do, you'll understand that what I have here is exactly the same as this. Now I need to go back to my section and replace that selected date with the binding. And because it is a binding, we don't need a dollar sign. 
I have a problem with this though because my date is optional, yet it's displaying the current date. What I'd like to have is if the date has not yet been set, display a button that says enter date. And then after I've selected a date, I'd like another button that is going to allow me to set it back to nil. So first, let me surround this with an if clause that checks to see if the selected date is not equal to nil. If it is, then we'll get an else statement where I can display a labeled content view with the same label as our date, which is select date. But for the content, I'm going to present a button. And for the label of the button, I'm going to use the string add date. And then the action will simply be to set the selected date to the current date, giving a person a starting point. Now, when we tap the button, the button disappears, and we get the date picker with the current date entered. Now, as I said, I'd also like to be able to clear that date by setting it back to nil. So to do this, I can wrap the date picker in an H stack. And then as the second item in the H stack, I'll create a button with an action and a label. And the action will be to set the selected date to nil. And then the label will be an image using the system name xmark.circle.fill. Now, as you see, we have a clear button once we've selected a date. But if we tap it, the date clears, and we're back to our button. I think this is a nice interface. And the same technique would work for a color picker as well. There are other cases where creating your own custom bindings can be really useful, particularly if your underlying models use different types from what the controls you're using require. As we saw with optionals for text fields with a string or a date picker. So let me do another example. On this second tab, I see that I have a slider that's bound to a double state property that's initialized at 5.0. Now the slider is incrementing between one and 100 in steps of one. And I'm displaying that number in a text view. And I have to convert that double to an int to display the values as an integer using string interpolation in the text view. My underlying model, however, may be using an int because after all, we are stepping by one, so we can use an int in our view. So let me change this slider value here to an int and change the initial value to five. Of course, our slider breaks. So let me just try to change the step from a double down to a one as an int, but that does no good. You can see we get an error that the binding must conform to a binary floating point or a double, and our step will automatically be the case as a double anyway. So we'll need to create a custom binding property that is a binding to a double. So I'm going to do that again up in our declarations by creating a double binding that is a binding of type double. So to create the binding, I'm going to forego the code completion with tree and enclosures as I know now what it should look like. The binding has two arguments, both are closures. The first has a get label, and that returns a simple closure. And then the second has a set label that returns a closure, but with an argument that we can call new value that we can use in our closure. For the getter, this needs to be a double value. So what I can simply do is return the double conversion of our int slider value. For the setter, we have to take that new value and convert it to an int and then assign it to the slider value. So we can do that using $0 in the case to represent the new value and then convert that to an int and assign it to the slider value. Now we can go and change our form section to have that value bound to the new double binding. And again, because it's already a binding, no dollar sign. Our slider works now just as before, except that our value is getting updated as an int. Well, if you're using view models, 
Sometimes you'll have optional properties in that view model that will require a custom binding rather than just the observed property. In this final tab, you'll see we have a state property that is an instance of a view model. And that view model is really quite simple. It's a class that's adorned with the observable macro, so its properties can be observed. And there are three. First name and last name are both strings, but middle name is an optional string. The initializer has a default value of nil for the middle name, so we do not need to enter a value when creating an instance. And that's why in our view, we simply see the first name and the last name being used when I create that state property. So the form is currently just displaying the text fields for the first and the last name because they are strings and there are no issues. But what if I wanted to add a form field for the middle name as well? And it's an optional. Well, since we're using a view model approach here, we'll need to go to the view model to create our custom binding that will replace the binding to the optional middle name property. So in the view model, I'm going to create a new property called middle binding that is a binding to a string. Now this will replace our attempt to bind to the optional middle name. So we'll need to create that binding. And as before, we know that it must have a get and a set property that both return closures. So the first with no argument, and then a second with an argument that we'll call new value again to be used in the closure. For the get, we'll simply return the middle name, but because it's an optional, we can no coalesce it to an empty string. This is just as we did in the name property in the first example. So similarly for the set, we'll use the new value to check to see if it is empty, and if so, we'll assign nil to the middle name, otherwise we'll assign that to the new value. And then we'll use $0 to replace that new value in each case. So middle name is equal to, depending on whether or not the new value is $0 or empty, it's either nil if it is, or new value, or $0 itself. Here though, because we're in a class, you must explicitly use self to make the capture semantics explicit. We can return now to our view, and we'll create a new text build for the middle name, where our label can be the string middle name. But the text is going to be bound to the view model's middle binding. Again, no dollar sign because the property is a binding itself. Now we can enter a middle name. So that's the end of this video. And I, I hope you've learned something useful here that you can use in your own projects going forward. Thanks for watching. If you found this tutorial helpful, please give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment. You can subscribe to my channel to get notifications of new videos. And remember that you can also download my YouTube channel listing app for free and quick access to all of my 350 plus YouTube videos. A link's in the description. And also remember I have a full Swift, Swift UI course available on my Teachable site where you learn how to build a fun, multi-targeted app.